Hello, it's Tom here. Before we get into this week's episode of Last Orders, I just want to let you all know that Spike's brilliant internship program is now back and open for applications. We're looking for an aspiring journalist to join our team on a six-month paid full-time placement. You'd be working with us at the Spiked office in London, helping us to do everything from putting out our articles to producing podcasts like this one. And you don't need any prior experience to apply. What we're looking for is someone who has a spark for journalism, writing, or podcasting, and who has a passion for our message, for our pro-freedom, pro-human politics, everything else you can learn on the job. I actually started at Spite as an intern, so I can highly recommend applying for this. It's a brilliant experience, and we can't wait to welcome you into the team. So to find out more and to apply, just go to spiked-online.com slash interns. That's spiked-online.com slash interns. You have until Sunday, the 19th of May to apply. Good luck. Welcome to Last Orders, the Spike podcast all about freedom and the nanny state. In this episode, we discuss the landmark CAS review, the WHO's misinformation on vaping, and the free speech wars in comedy. Hello and welcome back to Last Orders. I'm Tom Slater, editor of Spiked, joined as I am in every single episode by Chris Snowden from the Institute of Economic Affairs. How are you doing, Chris? Very well, thanks, Tom. Hello, listeners. And we're delighted to be joined on the show today by Josh Howie. Josh is a stand-up comedian. You'll have seen him also on GB News headliners. And he's just described himself to me, an involuntary commentator. So Josh, thanks so much for joining us today. Pleasure. And this is, I feel like this is the, I've made it finally. To the Last Orders podcast. Yeah, because... I, I've done obviously thousands of podcasts, but it's yeah. always to talk about or to just talk, you know, do, I'm trying to not swear in the first 30 seconds, yeah. but essentially to do, be funny. Yeah. And, um, but it might be that today I might have opinions, mm. which is strange that I found myself on this path. Uh, that's not where I thought I was going in my life. I thought I was just going to talk about, I think 30 seconds have passed so I can talk about my knob. <laughs> <laughs> which is but, quite topical this week given, and also because we're in Westminster so. it's always topical yeah <laughs> uh, but uh it's like somewhere along the way I had to actually um have opinions about stuff mm. and talk about it and think about things and here I am right now and with lots of thoughts for you <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm buckled up for this so the, one of the things I know you have quite passionate opinions about is the whole trans issue and it's something that you cover mm. a lot on GB News that and it's been a this landmark report this week yeah that, Final report of the CAS review, this is Dr. Hilary Cass, a top paediatrician, has been working on this for four years and has delivered this 400-page piece of work, which basically lays waste to the sort of clinical evidence base for what was generally called kind of gender-affirming care. So saying, as she'd already previously made public, that puberty blockers are a essentially there's no evidence for them. And to the extent that there is evidence for them, it suggests that maybe it pushes kids down the the medical pathway, cross-sex hormones, a similar picture, even some notes about kind of social transitioning, allowing kids to change names and presentation can lead them, doesn't necessarily seem to alleviate any of their distress, but can lead them towards these irreversible sort of um, treatments. What have you made of all of this, Josh, in terms of the, the report itself, I guess, but also just the reaction and how people have been talking about it? Well, the report is comprehensive and pretty much definitive mm. and just lays out um, in a well-researched way what regular human beings with brains have been saying and demonized for years for saying. And now it's sort of there in print with sources and, and whatnot. So there's an element of vindication. I think a lot of people feel that. There's also anger um, because that it's got this far that this is arguably the biggest medical scandal of our time, that our children, up to 9,000 children, have been adversely affected by an ideology. Um, and... Along with that, the, the, it's also been interesting to see the reactions of what I would term the other side, the mm. trans ideology group, because someone made an interesting point online. They've spent years denying facts. Yeah. So the idea that presenting them more facts is going to lead to some kind of mere culpa it just hasn't happened. Yeah. So there, I see the point of attack backwards coming in, in two forms. One is to say, first of all, that they're like, look at how she rejected all of these really amazing scientific reports and the whole point was that they weren't scientific that yeah. they they didn't have control groups there was there were reasons why this was but uh, that she made those decisions to not include them and um and this is there seems to be their big primary source of attack 
And the other one, and it's also very frustrating, is see James O'Brien put out, there was a funny clip that went out of him, <laughs> uh, basically just going, well, essentially the real thing here is about the toxicity and I'm the one who's been trying to detoxify it the whole time. And it's like, no, mate, you're the one who's been adding to it. Yeah. And so you're seeing um, that she makes a point in the report about how what so what's been so damaging and why it's got so far is because the toxicity from the gender ideologues has meant that a lot of doctors weren't able to talk through their concerns as people were being, children were being medicalized for life. And that's the point that she makes. But 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 people have sort of latched onto this, like, it's both sides. It's like, no, there was only one side that was hashtag no debate. Yeah. And then there was a bunch of normal people started mostly with lesbians and far left lesbians and mm-hmm. feminists and uh, being um, losing their jobs and and being vilified for doing so, uh, who were just trying to say, look, we need to have a closer look at it. And they were just utterly, utterly yeah. demonized. So it's so frustrating now to see people like James O'Brien. It's always frustrating to see him, to be honest. Yeah, but to particularly, remember that a thing is yeah, bad. Is, uh, but to see him kind of going, oh, yeah, look, I told you so, and so mm-hmm. smugly, yeah. and being so much part of why this debate why it took 400 pages and a yeah. four-year report to just get normality. Absolutely. And the both sidesism is very irritating. I think one, that's one of the unfortunate things about the report is that it, there are parts of it which plays into that to a certain extent. And of course, all the usual suspects have latched onto that. But I don't think we could expect everything from this particular report. It wasn't to set all the discussions. But Chris, what have you made of the... Um, not necessarily the the report, but the meltdown over it afterwards, is it? I'm glad you asked me that question because I haven't read the report at all. I haven't even read that much about the report. But what I have seen... This is your classic admission is, in every podcast. I, as you know, Tom, I make a point of not doing any research yeah. about the issues. You've got the raw, unvarnished... I want to be the everyman yeah. who's channeling the, you know, the, the kind of moron who listens to this podcast, so channeling their questions. Um, so I know I'm, I'm very ignorant about the content of the report. All I can say is it must have been extremely compelling because I've never seen a government report make so many people suddenly change their minds and go, okay, fair enough, we got this wrong. Normally when the government produces a report, whether it's about the Iraq war or whatever, it gets accused of being a whitewash. People, no one yeah. changes their mind. Everybody who believes something in the first place continues to believe it and says, well, it's just t- typical government would say that. This instance, you've had you know, Wes Streeting and Yvette Cooper and James O'Brien up to a point, and even Stonewall <laughs> up to a point, kind of going, like, okay, it's a fair cop. We got this one wrong. Um, you caught us. We were sterilizing yeah, the kids. So I'm I mean, sorry. But it's, but yeah. I, it's kind of amazing, really, and, and tribute to Dr. Cass for uh, managing to do that. The other thing I'd say is, uh, and this sounds almost too good to be true, but as I was coming on the train up to London to do this, I was sat next to a woman who was talking to her 17-year-old son. Um, he, he was going to be 18 in five days' time. That's how I knew he was 17. If they're listening about it, no. <laughs> I'm talking about it. They probably aren't listening. Um, but it, just to show how much cut through this has got, yeah. she just spontaneously brought up this report, started kind of describing what was what was in it, um, and then said, oh, you know, such and such down the road, whose daughter decided she wanted to be a boy a few years ago, and she got various bits of treatment, um, and then changed her mind. You know, So this stuff is, you know, obviously it's only a small sample, I yeah. accept that. But, you know, normal people are talking about this. It's got cut through. And it seems to have kind of ended this debate, which is incredible and very good. And my question is, I guess, is that is that, is that the kind of war one now? Is it from from you know, reasonable people's point of view? It seems most of the sports federations are saying no, you can't be a man, you know, entering women's yeah. sport. Um, the the idea of sending people born men into women's prison seems to be dying away. And now we've dealt with the kind of converting kids. So, I mean, aside from that, I'm not bothered about the trans issue at all. They, they were only ever the, the problems I had with it. Well, I think that there's um, a few continuations from the report. That people were concerned uh, because the, the private clinics were still able to, um, to prescribe mm-hmm. this medication, but I believe that loophole looks like it's being closed. Yeah. There's also issues with the adult uh, gender services not giving across their data. And I believe now a separate report is now going to be um, launched into that. The big thing, and then my fear was Labour, I'm a traditional Labour supporter, not in the Corbyn era, it has to be said. But um, West Streeting coming out immediately, so strongly, as you say, backing the report, and so much of Labour also doing so. I mean, there's a cowardice, the way that they treated Rosie Duffield uh, through this entire time. But it, that somewhat um, 
refreshing and a relief to hear. But here's the thing. They're still, Labour is still backing the conversion bill. And that puts forward this idea that um, not affirming these kids who sort of say that they're, even though they're autistic and have these other underlying conditions, it's still saying that if you don't immediately affirm them and go, yep, yeah, you are definitely a boy because you say you're a boy or vice versa, then you are breaking the law. And Labour, on paper, are mm. still pushing that policy mm. forward. Yeah. So that, I think, is a concern. And in terms of, I think this crossed over actually a long time ago. I've heard people talking about it for a while. I think what it does is give permission for people to, to, to talk about it now. And it gives permission for journalists to do their job which sickens me, like Newsnight. Oh, look, oh, here we are, the reasonable people after demonizing people like Graham Lennon or whoever it is and not covering this, which is their job. I, this is what, you know, we mm. talked about, sorry to get passionate for a second, but we talked about how I'm reluctantly here. Mm. I'm here because people didn't do their job. I don't want to be here. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I don't want to read this report and do this stuff. I'm, I've got loads of kids. I've got a busy life. The last thing I want to be doing is having to talk about the stuff and read the stuff and research stuff and think about the stuff. I just want to trust that yeah. the adults in the room, which I do not consider myself, have will have done their jobs. The journalists out there and the politicians, they would have been brave and they would have seen something wrong and they would have stepped up to the plate. And they didn't. Yeah. And, it, and it's so frustrating and annoying that somehow I've had to now have opinions about things. Uh, I, have a, I have a very similar response to this because on the one hand, you think the fact that so many people now have an excuse, a reason to be able to say, okay, there's, there's a problem here. Let's accept what this report is saying. I mean, and let's gesture vaguely to what a horrible debate it's been. Fine. Whatever needs to get you kind of over the line is fine. But at the same time, as you say, the kind of shamelessness of not just not covering this stuff, but an outlet like the BBC was pumping out really questionable stuff about gender identity, often some of it aimed at children. Um, the demonization, as you say, it's not even that they they either wouldn't platform gender critical voices, or when they did, they were just there to be like hissed at, more or less. Like when Graham Linehan did Newsnight a few years ago and he was just confronted with his alleged bigotries for about eight minutes. Mm. Um, for them to now turn around and be like, so we're now talking to our correspondent, apparently something terrible has been going on in the gender services. It is, It sticks in the craw, doesn't it, to, mm. to an extent. But I think it raises that question of what happens now, because as you were saying at the beginning, Josh, the problem here was never really the fact that um, they were working on the basis of shoddy data. The fact that was that they had a motivation, they, they were given to a kind of ideology and the rest of the health service or the rest of society were quite happy to let them carry on with it. So I guess the question is, like, how do we do that extra step, which is, trying to dislodge that ideology, which was never based in reason or fact or even standard medical practice. It was because people have got this idea in their heads that there is such a thing as gender. It's almost like a soul. Mm. And also there's a lot of people who are just willing to virtue signal rather than think. So I guess that extra step of how do we push back this ideology? I, what, what, how do you I, I think it, I, like I mean, I th I'm slightly pessimistic here. I mean, um, Helen Joyce, who wrote Trans, uh, gave an, an interview about a year ago or so where she said the parents of the of trans children will be like the last people to have any, will never accept it because um, they're like, they're going to be like the Japanese soldiers at the end of World War II or, you know, fighting on. Yeah. Because to accept it would be to accept that they have um, irreversibly damaged their children. I would take it further and basically say that the sadly the world we're living in is that nobody takes accountability anymore and nobody says that they're wrong doubly so or and i'm guilty of that as much as a normal human being but the the i would say the left or the perceived be kind brigade just cannot accept that they are infallible mm -hmm. it's it's and i saw this this is what got me into just stuff was yes. corbyn and whatever it's just again none of them could no one could accept that they just oh there might be an issue on this like there could be a problem maybe we need to look into this but no it has to be i'm a good person i believe this and i'm pure mm -hmm. and everybody else is some right-wing evil person trying to either in this case kill kids or get them to commit so i mean it's it's so frustrating because it just takes the smallest amount of um of self-awareness mm -hmm. to to so we can move forward and i just feel like i'm just thinking now i want to email this friend she's a wife of a good friend of mine we've had so many arguments about this and it's just like is she, if i send her this report or if i send her some sort mm -hmm. of um the times article that did a very good sort of summary of everything uh, what will her will she finally go okay yeah maybe we should look at this or mm -hmm. will she just still be convinced this is like some right-wing conspiracy yeah 
I don't did, know. Did it really come as a shock to these people, genuinely, when this report came out? I mean, did they just... I, I don't follow these things very closely, but I knew, like, the Tavistock Clinic had been closed yeah. down, and I'd read various stories, numerous stories about people, you know, essentially having sex changes as children and changing their mind about it. Did this really come as a shock? Have they just been blocking out what everyone's been saying all I this time? I think it was just the point at which it couldn't be ignored anymore, mm. really. I think that was the thing, because ev- almost, everything, almost everything in this report has been previously... Mm. said or any of the statistics that the report debunks have been previously debunked i mean everything from puberty block i mean puberty block is already banned by the nhs because of cassidy's investigation but the fact that the vast majority of these kids are either gay or bisexual so therefore this looks and feels like the most brutal form of gay conversion therapy you could ever really think about the fact that um puberty blockers were sold as this kind of pause but really they seem to be like more it's not they're not a break they're an accelerator they almost always lead to them to take cross sex almost that was already known this idea that if you don't affirm them and give them hormones they're going to kill themselves the report makes clear there's nothing to back that up there's even some information coming out now and reports now which are claiming that the opposite might well be true so it's not that this, these things weren't known maybe they weren't so widely known but i think the problem was is that because this in, this ideology had gripped mainstream institutions it was always going to take mainstream institutions and mainstream media to admit mm. something was wrong for that to change. And up until this point, it's only really been right, yeah. people on, you know, podcasts and in alternative <laughs> media who were willing to talk about it for a long time until quite recently. Yeah. And now they'll talk about it and now they will sort of go, oh yeah, this and, and like, like they've been reasonable the whole time. Yeah. But they haven't. It's been <laughs> these captured organisations and that's what I guess, that's what it means to be captured. And it's incredible how high it rose and it rose in a Tory government Absolutely. because they wanted to be kind, but but be kind without doing any reading, without listening to any dissenting ideas. And that's, I feel like the problem is just it comes down to, because I've seen so much of this and I'm fighting this thing. With my, I, I belong to a synagogue and I've seen them, they've been putting these programs in and actually teaching my kids about this, about trans, like there's a trans woman and and all this stuff. And it's like, it's all come through and they're, they're cons- somewhat conservative as well, but they just want to be kind, but they want to yeah. be kind and they don't want to actually read an article or, or put any work in to it. it. So that's what I guess is meant by virtue signaling. But it's the it's the lack of effort. And once they have come down on a the side, then woe be told, you yeah. come and present them with other information. Yeah. I almost do have more contempt for those people. It's not even that they were up to their necks in the ideology no. and could quote it tra- chapter and verse. It's just they wanted to look like a good person, so they t- turned a blind eye or actually shamed people who were pointing out this terrible medical scandal but you were talking there josh about captured institutions chris should we talk about the ultimate captured institution which is yeah. the world health organization hey. and their latest output on the question of vaping something we cover a lot on this on this podcast what have they been saying about um about vaping and how allegedly dangerous it is uh quite a bit they can't seem to shut up about it despite the fact that they keep getting community noted which i should say to people who are not on twitter brackets formerly known as x or the other way around x formerly known as twitter um the, the elon musk He's done a lot of things on Twitter which I don't really agree with. He's done quite a few things I do agree with, but the best thing of all is the community note. Absolutely. So normal people can now essentially, I guess, complain or try and correct a note. I mean, but essentially, you, you reply to tweets anyway, and if someone says something very stupid, that tweet is likely to attract hundreds of people saying more or less the same thing and perhaps citing the same kind of evidence. And what community notes does through, I guess, an algorithm, I think. I don't know. Maybe there's somebody in a control booth or somewhere. Anyway, what they do is... Um, they then, after a while, if enough people corroborate the criticism, they will put a little, essentially a warning box underneath the tweet saying the community has said this. You can then vote on whether that community note is is, is accurate or not. Um, I've never seen one that's wrong, actually. Mm. I, think, I think community notes are usually pretty good and they correct, they correct uh, disinformation very nicely. So, you know, the WHO, as a result, it, it's inveterate lying and compulsive pathological line <laughs> keeps getting community noted which is not really something that you want to do if you are the world health organization it's supposed to be a, a trusted source of scientific information so the most recent one they put out a tweet saying vaping causes seizures usually within the first 24 hours um there is essentially no evidence for this i think they, <laughs> they might have had some study that they kind of mis- misunderstood or something in rodents or something like that but um the only mechanism by which vaping could cause seizures would be through nicotine, but it doesn't. And we know that because smokers don't have seizures and smokers have been around for a very long time using a lot of nicotine. So this was untrue. And within a few hours, we've got the community note. And it's and it's great. And this is not the first time. I can't think of another WHO one 
uh, that's been community noted. Back in the day before community notes, they uh, it was actually in February 2020, when you might think there are better things to, mm. to focus on. They put out a huge Twitter thread about vaping, which included such pills of wisdom as e-cigarette fluid burns the skin and uh, something to do with causing fires and stuff. It's causing really, fires? Really weird. because of the battery or something? Yeah, which I suppose that has happened, to be fair. But, I mean, they, they the made out it was quite it. a routine occurrence. Um, there's another organisation. This is some one of Mike Bloomberg's many front groups called the GGTC. I don't even know what it stands for. It doesn't really matter. But they put something out the other day. I'll read it to you. The transition of hashtag tobacco industry to so-called reduced risk products like e-cigs and heated tobacco devices is a deceitful pivot. Despite claims of harm reduction, they remain just as detrimental, if not more so. And that's been community noted saying this post insinuates harm reduction systems such as cause greater harm than combustible cigarettes. This has been identified as disinformation. So it's great. I mean, I've been trying to expose the lies of the public health lobby for many, many years. And now the community is doing it Mm -hmm. uh, quite effectively. And you would hope, I mean, the WHO is a pretty shameless organization, but you would think if it continually gets community noted, someone's going to say, can we at least try fact-checking some of these, or at least wording them in a way that makes our disinformation kind of defensible in some technical sense? Um, I don't know. Like I say, they're totally shameless. These things are produced anonymously. Who the hell knows who's behind it? and again, you know, going back to Bloomberg, I don't want to sound too conspiratorial about it, but when you've got a billionaire... It's sort of your Bill Gates, isn't it? Hundreds, yeah, right. But, it is, <laughs> but there is, this is absolutely, you know, backed this up one's with true, solid yeah. evidence. <laughs> it is a fact that Mike Bloomberg is a puritanical prohibitionist with yep. many billions of pounds, and he has pumped many hundreds of millions of pounds towards media organisations, towards pressure groups, and all sorts of other people, and, 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 and to the WHO. He is a global ambassador on non-communicable diseases, basically, because he gives them a huge amount of money. So he is, to a large extent, pulling the string, certainly when it comes to tobacco and vaping at the WHO. That, I think, is a huge moral um, quagmire, right? Very difficult to defend one guy having quite so much influence uh, over an organization that's supposed to be independent. Mm. But isn't the disinformation campaign sort of working? I mean, in the UK, we started yeah. to implement, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've talked about it many times, the ban on single-use vapes, the crackdown on flavours that everyone seems to want to have. It's much worse in other countries. Like, could we really be in the situation where this this wonder invention, <laughs> this answer to that question, imagine if you could invent a cigarette that didn't actually kill you, could actually be, uh, not if not stamped out, then just regulated to the point of not being as attractive a prospect. Are we really kind of facing that now, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I think we are, because... Um, the government still hasn't actually laid out what it wants to do on vaping other than it wants to ban disposable vapes, which I may have mentioned before, make up mm. 87% of the e-cigarette market. So this is quite a step in mm. itself, right? You're banning you know, the, the vast majority of vapes. Um, but he's also said, Rishi Sunak, he's also said he wants to ban or restrict, he wants to do something which he hasn't quite decided what to yeah. do on flavors and packaging and branding and things like that. Um, and even though the legislation has been produced is going to second reading on Tuesday. Um, he still hasn't decided what he wants to do. So all the all legislation says is regarding vape packaging, re- regarding vape flavors, the Secretary of State will have power to do basically whatever they want. That's good. <laughs> it's a sort of enabling act just to, to regulate the <laughs> vaping in whatever you want. Or for West Streeting specifically, let's, let's face it. Yeah. It's, it's legislation to say West Streeting can do whatever he wants to vaping. West Streeting, for his part, has said he wants to come down like a ton of bricks on vaping and vape companies, these exact words. So, yes, I think the scenario you present is absolutely realistic. West Street, good on the trans issue now, bad on the vapes. Josh, any thoughts on this? Well, look, I, I, I'm going to have to slightly dissent in my opinions about these things. First of all, I hate smoking so much. Like, if I could press a button and just all the cigarettes would disappear mm-hmm. from humanity, I would. I just... I, I, I hate it. I've never smoked. I've always hated it. You're on the right podcast, in which case we're yeah, the, the well, UK's premier pro-smoking podcast. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, I see, you know, rightly or wrongly, um, and I'm willing to be open to mm. reading more information about this, but, you know, uh, vapes as a continuation of that, obviously a much lesser form, but still, like, if, if for me, cigarettes are evil, then it's just like a, a more acceptable or lesser form of it, even if it's minuscule. So I don't want kids smoking it. I think that I I hear you that the majority of the market is um, is you know is disposable, but I still think that that's not necessarily a, a good thing. And I think banning it 
and um, it, it is, is those those disposable ones. I see them on the floor, littered everywhere. Maybe people go, oh, well, the art problem is people throwing them away or what. But um, disposable for disposable sake. And also this whole flavor issue, um, I do see that as a way of attracting kids. Uh, so I'm sorry, that's my disagreement. I'm not saying that I wouldn't change my mind. Uh, I think for me, the issue or something that's uh, concerns me more um, is as uh, I see him <laughs> vapes being passively aggressively yeah. smoked. Yeah, no, he's like, he's passively back. aggressively and I, and I get, toking on his bubblegum flavor. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I get it, and it's great, and it is much less likely to cause harm. That doesn't, I don't believe that necessarily means it's not going to cause any harm. But, uh, you know, and I think that this report was, has been absolutely, was ridiculous. It was like a bunch of humans. They were like, I think it was humans who were reporting that they, not rats, but who said they get seizures. But it was like, it wouldn't even define what seizures were. And yeah. also nicotine can have, they might have, you know, it sounds like they misconstrued. It wasn't with doctors there. It was like, they were just going, oh, I've had heart palpitations or whatever, which nicotine could cause, could. Um, anyway, the problem is, as going back to previous issue for me is, is, this sort of institutional capture, which relates to what kind of what you were talking about, and the distrust that we're going to have in these institutions, like the WHO, which is meant to be this kind of um, overreaching uh, system that we trust, and we just continually see more distrust in these systems as they don't check their facts or actively lie or actively work in the pursuit of other people's aims or whatever it is. So that's a real problem. Countering that is, I think, also what you you were saying was, you know, things like the community notes where, in a way, people have been forced to engage with these issues. And unfortunately, whilst we lose or while we uh, gain or distrust or lose trust in these in these things that we would normally happy to just kind of go along with, I think we also have a counterbalance of people who are um, looking, you know, willing to examine, willing to look into this stuff mm -hmm. more. So... Um, I don't see it as, I think it's sad that we're having to do that. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I'd rather just be lazy and just be just able to, to defer. Trust, to defer. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's good that we have the tools to be able to do it and that people are doing it. And maybe, maybe that in a grander scheme of things will push humanity forward. Mm -hmm. And we, as we take a more active role within the systems that guide us. I want, I want to move on to a bit about hate crime. But before we do that, Chris, if, if given the fact that Josh there has articulated a lot of the kind of concerns that a lot of people actually you bump into mm -hmm. have about vaping, um, whether it's the flavours, whether it's about how safe it is, if you were to give your kind of nutshell elevator pitch as to why this is actually a good thing, what would you say it, it was? Well, there's the libertarian argument, which is I should be allowed to use nicotine if I want to, and I'm not mm -hmm. doing any harm to anybody else. And there's a public health argument that, you know, we're not going to just get rid of smoking. Um, or indeed vaping, and um, you might consider vaping lesser of two evils, but that's what harm reduction is, right? It is mm. going for the lesser of two evils. Um, the reality is, any, and this has been shown in, in study after study on various different policies and taxes, anything you do to deter vape use encourages smoking. Now, I don't care. I don't care whether people smoke or not. It doesn't bother me one bit. I'm not even that bothered about whether I go back to smoking. It seems the government's much more keen on me. They're pushing you in that direction. Me not smoking. Yeah. I'm not that bothered. <laughs> if they're going to push me towards smoking, I'll go back to smoking. I don't, I don't care. I quite enjoy smoking. <laughs> for the last 12 years, I've been a non-smoker because of vaping. And um, and there's m millions of people you know, like me. So you know, if you do ban the flavours, um, you will push people back to smoking. There's no two ways about it. If you mm -hmm. ban the disposables, you'll definitely push some people. Who knows how many? A lot of people obviously will go to the rechargeables. Maybe, maybe that's good. Um, but undoubtedly, some people will go back to smoking. Now, as I say, I'm not too bothered about that, other than the fact that they're making essentially the second best choice from their own perspective because of unnecessary regulation. But from the government's point of view and from public health people's point of view and the WHO's point of view, you would think they would, of all people, think that is a very bad thing. So there are always trade-offs. And here, you know, the the the, the realistic option is not nobody ever using nicotine again yeah it is people using nicotine in the safest way possible it's a very good drug as well it's yeah, you, you, persu aside, you no. persuaded me chris <laughs> <laughs> no i mean those are totally totally valid points i i you know and i and frankly I, I i agree with them i i i get it i do i just what can i say i have a visceral hatred mm -hmm. of cigarettes as do a lot of people it's including both the prime minister certainly west streeting 
Yeah. It seems quite mainstream at this point, unfortunately. But um, shall we talk about hate crime? Why Another not? serious topic. Come on. Um, but less serious in a sense, because also uh, beginning this month, on the 1st of April, Scotland's notorious hate crime act came into effect, descended into farce very quickly. They were overwhelmed with complaints, um, many of them spurious. Um, one of the uh, the m- biggest alleged hate criminals in Scotland at the moment is one Hamza Yusuf, because people were <laughs> complaining about the First Minister's speech that he gave a while ago, complaining that various Scottish institutions were too white. Um, so it's, re- it's really showed up what happens when, as this act does, basically trying to police hate, trying to police speech. Um, but also, Josh, I know that you, you yourself were involved in going up to Scotland mm. to mark the introduction of the Hate Crime Act um, with a comedy show, which um, our friends over at Comedy Unleashed put together. So, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Because I'm sure many people have heard about the whole Hate Crime Act thing. It's been big news for a good for a good while now. But um, how was the show in Edinburgh? What did you want to do sure. achieve with it? We wanted to get arrested. I was just desperate. <laughs> <laughs> there was actually a lawyer there on the night. Uh, it wasn't to spread hate, of course, but it was partly to call attention to this mm. to mark the occasion. As you said, uh, we took up acts. I don't think anybody did anything different to what they would normally do in yeah. terms of their stand-up, but there has been this um, uh, development, a uh, censorous development in stand-up over the last few years, certainly which is why places, things like Comedy Unleashed were created, of um, comics not being able to talk necessarily or joke about certain subjects, including the trans issue. And... Um, and and in Edinburgh, you had Jerry Sadowitz being cancelled mm. and you had people like uh, who I have a great artistic respect for and I like as a person, although uh, I've been disappointed with him in recent years. Uh, but Stuart Lee, like not defending one of his comedy heroes, Jerry Sadowitz, and kind of going, oh, well, things change and whatever. It's like, no, this yeah. th- we have artistic freedom. This is what comedy at the purest is about, is challenging and pushing and upsetting people. Uh, so we were up there to upset people potentially <laughs> but that doesn't isn't necessarily the same as, as hate and that's mm-hmm. of course the point of it uh for my own part i emceed it and we had different acts i got to be honest with you some of the acts weren't to my taste but this, as someone else made the valid point lewis schaefer who's a very funny comic he basically said i have to fight for the right for this person to the, say the stuff that i don't like and i actually was offended by so that i can mm-hmm. say the stuff that i want to say and joke about so that was why we were there. What upset people most on the night, we were the first venue cancelled on us. So we, um, after they Googled um, yep. Comedy Unleashed, which is ridiculous. Uh, the second venue was the Hibs um, Football Club, uh, Sports as Bar. And the biggest boo of the night was when I thanked uh, the Hearts for letting us be in their uh, club. And uh, that was... It was a joke, obviously, but they they were like, "Whoa!" They could have <laughs> all the other issues More that we we talked about. They were like, "How dare you!" Um, but it was a really it was a great night. It was really mm-hmm. funny. The audience, I think, and I I got, I got to be honest. When I first did comedy unleashed, part of me was like, "Is this going to be right wing? Is yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. going to be like a Nazi or something?" Like, I didn't know what to expect. What it is is a bunch of people who are politically engaged, who have a different different points of view. Uh, across a spectrum of different, whether they were brought to it by Brexit or by communism or by the trans movement or whatever it is, people's are old or COVID or whatever, people's eyes have been open over the last sort of six, mm-hmm. seven years. I think a lot of people have been on a journey and seeing things like the hate bill come through, um, realizing how we, we are having our rights eroded mm-hmm. and taking a step towards that. So actually when you went into this place, it was totally sold out, sold out in like nine minutes. And it was sort of 250 people, very nice, very sweet, um, who were there to kind of say, look, this is ridiculous. And to highlight the the stupidity of some of these laws that have been mm-hmm. put in place. And the hate monster was there? Oh, sorry. There was a hate monster. It was great. Yes. There, so, so there was a uh, an outfit made and it was very funny. Mm-hmm. And they sort of commenting on the, the bill itself. And- we, we should say the hate monster was <laughs> yeah. a, a public information campaign that the Scottish government put out to warn people to be careful now that the new hate crime law came <laughs> on. It was a little animation which featured this thing called the hate monster saying, you know, you might be walking down the road and then suddenly the hate monster gets you and you start, you know, abusing yeah, immigrants. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was an incredible, <laughs> revealing piece of public information. It's like a yeah, tango. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was great. But yeah, we someone built this, this This woman built this real life costume. We had a comic inside it. And then uh, it was really funny. It was mm. it was very good. It was Yeah, and it was great. And pe- people loved it. And just it highlighted 
the absurdity of and also the danger that that Scotland certainly is is moving in in its in its desperation to again be kind but not consider the ramifications to our freedoms. Mm-hmm. Chris, well, I mean, the SNP is quite a hateful party itself, isn't it? Absolutely. I don't say that as a criticism <laughs> because I'm quite a hateful man, but it is a party that's really, let's be honest, built on hatred of the English. When you look at someone like Hammer, what's he called? Hamza Yusuf. Hamza, Hamza Yusuf, yeah. Hamza, Hamza Yusuf or Nicholas Sturgeon, you know, you don't really get a sense of love and, and empathy, do you? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're this angry, hateful people, which is fine. So am I, like I say. <laughs> uh, don't start clamping down on hate when that's your, your whole raison d'etre. They love it. Like, the SNP uh, were really, the, as soon as they get into power, the authoritarianism came through. Yeah. Like, one of the big things they did when they first got into power under Alex Salmon was clamp down on offensive behaviour at the football. So this the offensive behaviour at football act, yeah. um, which was mainly targeted around kind of like sectarian sort of chanting between Celtic and Rangers and whatnot, which there is, especially at this day and age, there's a largely kind of pantomime aspect to that, you know, but still that that was brought in, that eventually got repealed. They, they wanted to introduce that named person scheme where every child would have a state guardian who would watch out for them. It was a really concerning sort of initiative that got pushed back. And now this, but um, I love hateful chanting at the football. It's the best thing about it. Offensive chants, like outrageously offensive chants at the football. He's absolutely brilliant. Your vape is name. Now they're talking, <laughs> they're talking about tra- tragedy chanting as a phrase that suddenly yeah, pops yeah, up. Yeah. I've never heard of it before. And there's this weird thing where it's suddenly a thing. And suddenly you've got do. you've got like pundits on Talksport pretending to take this incredibly seriously that people make <laughs> outrageous offensive jokes at football matches. I, I was I was reading. You might have to cut this out. I was reading. Um, <laughs> reading something on the BBC News website a few mm. weeks ago, and it was about terribly offensive chants that had been directed at Chester City fans, mm-hmm. um, obviously during a game. And the BBC being the BBC wouldn't tell you what the chant was. So yeah. immediately I'm going, right, Why do they do chant? that as well? Like, so no, annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's so, been arrested for saying something. I'm not going to tell you what yeah. it is. but it's, well, you know. Obviously that whets the appetite. So yeah, yeah. I went off and I found some Reddit thread or something where it said what yeah. the chant was. The chant was... She's one of your own. She's one of your own. Lucy Letby, she's one of your own. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite good, actually. Both offensive, but also, you know. I didn't know she played know. football it's as well. Hard. <laughs> it's highly offensive. She, but that's, she, she's that's part the, of a very successful five-side team. That's the joy of it. <laughs> Josh, you were talking there about um, the cancellation of Sadowitz at the Edinburgh Fringe a few years ago, and I yeah. think that was a real watershed yeah. moment because it was that combination of he was someone who was so willfully incredibly offensive, but also brilliant and used to being revered by not just people who have a taste for kind of edgy alternative, edgy comedy, but even from the kind of comedy great and good, Stuart Lee, as you were saying, other people like that were still previously in his corner, weren't anymore. Do you think that the um, there's a lot of talk about censorship and comedy, wokeness and comedy and whatever, but are more comics waking up to what a problem, not just this law, but this climate is, or is it going in the other direction? No, I think... I think they are waking up. I think what it, it, it's been a bit of a journey. I, I've i had, and I'm some, there's somewhat self serving comments here because I am a comic now, but before I was a comic, fascinated and obsessed with like Lenny Bruce mm-hmm. and, 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 and various other comics who sort of I see as pushing dialogue forward and being funny. But as being brave, yeah. that that would have been like funny, of course, but being brave, and and that's how that's always been my mindset. Getting into comedy, I still kind of believed it, and I maybe did some brave things. I don't know. I certainly got in a lot of fights, uh, but I still kind of had that idea of people um, being counter to the mainstream and or, or just just providing a counterpoint and and showing this a skewered look at different takes, and uh, even if they were maybe attack for it or laughed at mm-hmm. and then whatever it is. The point is what has shocked me is how the, the cowardice within the comedy industry, the conformity and the fear and, and saddened me. And I've, it's also sort of, I wouldn't say I've been kicked out as such, but to see it through uh, also just, I assume comics were quite clever and well-read and knew about stuff and, they just didn't. There was a real conformity there. And that was the other thing. They just wanted to conform. They just wanted a quiet, easy life. I'm like, why did you become a comic? Mm-hmm. So seeing that through, again, that journey of Corbynism and seeing this kind of like blinkered 
um, no, 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 we're the left and we definitely right. And there's no way that anybody could be anti-Semitic or racist on our side. Mm -hmm. So seeing it again then with the gender ideology and comics and uh, coming out and sort of attacking anybody who would sort of go, hey, wait a minute, look at this. Maybe prisons we should look at. Maybe we should look at sport. No, no, you're, Mm -hmm. you're a bigot. And seeing people kind of attack like that. And again, the silence of comics, the silence of comics that I respect just kind of who would normally ridicule this stuff. I mean, yeah. it's prime for ridicule. And they just were silent and then went along with it and then joined in the witch hunts themselves. You're like, what is going on here? So that has been a sort of um, a journey to, to to see it. And then just the the conformity lower down. I'm not like some famous comic. I'm a, I'm a journeyman comic, journey woman comic in the traveling the UK Less so now because I just uh, I can't handle the drives anymore. But uh, but you know yeah and but seeing my level of comedians who aren't necessarily on TV doing live at the Apollo and whatnot just kind of go along with it for fear. And this is it. It's so much fear based. Here's the end of this part of the journey: is there's a Christmas party every year of comics, and it's interesting for a few reasons. Because first of all, people you've been battling with online, you suddenly find Stuart's in the room over there, mm. and this person's over here, and you realise you've been sending nasty tweets about each other or whatnot. Suddenly they're there, and they're a human being. You forgot that you drove one time to Nottingham and had a real laugh, mm-hmm. and they're a human being. The spirit of Christmas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it always takes place after. They always say, yeah, in January. I'm sorry I called you out on your horrendous anti-Semitism. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so suddenly they're there and they're human, and um, which is always slightly weird. But what was interesting was people talking to me. B, I've been to GB News now for 200 bit years, so two of these Christmas parties, the first time it was like, it was somewhat of a prior, but I'm still mates with a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. And so people were kind of cute, like, oh, I'm surprised that you're doing GB News or, or whatever it is, yeah, yeah. never having watched the show or never even seeing what I talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, this year, being much more vocal about these issues for the first time. And I think because the fear has gone, because they are um, not getting work anymore anyway. I think a lot of them were holding out in the hope that they would do, you know, have right thing, commit to right thing, and they would get their slot. Well, you know what? They didn't get it, Mm -hmm. even though they were talented, even though they deserved it, because other people got it because they they weren't funny, but because they frankly fitted the agenda. Um, And I think you can read between the lines what I'm saying there. Um, comedy was a meritocracy. That's why I got into comedy. You know, look, I, I have a, I come from a relatively successful background in terms of my parents, and I have been given untold privilege, including nepotism or not. But nepotism doesn't help you on a Saturday night mm. in Newcastle. You got to be funny. You got to deliver, and that's it. That's why I like stand up, and I love the purity of that. And it was fair in that you got good, and you got great, and you got work. And the big clubs around the country would book you consistently. And, you know, TV was its own thing, but maybe you would break through there anyway. Well, TV, we knew, fell first. Mm -hmm. But now when it's fallen, when the circuit itself, when these institutions are, my institutions, the comedy store and other places are booking not according to who is the funniest, but but who can fit into this slot Mm -hmm. to make us look okay or good. Yeah even though it's contrary to their own um, uh, benefits, uh, benefit, where, where they are yeah. cancelling late shows now, having half-empty things, where the nights are not as good. So, yeah, I'm bitter and I'm angry about it because, for me, that contract was broken. Yeah, I made a deal that if I got funny, I would get that slot there on one of the best comedy clubs in the world, formally. Mm-hmm. That deal got broken. They are broken. It breaks our industry. It breaks... Comedy, arguably, because people aren't going on to be funny anymore. Yeah. They're going to make a point or to say the right thing or to project what they think is going to get them on telly. And everybody suffers, mm-hmm. including a lot of these comics who I was at this Christmas party with, who now are feeling the resentment and anger because, hey, they towed the company line yeah. and now they're not getting work. They put on the black square. They said what they needed to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're fast running out of time. But before we let you go, Josh, um, we normally ask a question at the end of this podcast, which is generally an anti-ban, quite liberal to libertarian podcast. So if you had to have one ban, what would it be? 
Now you've Brain already kind of on. said it <laughs> <laughs> in relation to smoking, <laughs> in relation to some other things. But the point of this, just to give you time mm. to think, is that it's something that's really petty and ridiculous. So in Chris's case, it's wheelie suitcase. Wheelie suitcases. VAR yeah. makes many appearances in this particular slot. So it's something which is so it just annoys you. It's so much so that if you did have that kind of dictator for a day, you could just say enough of that. But it can't be smoking because that would be so off brand for this podcast. It Am I allowed implode. to say Owen Jones? <laughs> Absolutely, please. Is that too, is that too, too big? Is he, he's, or is he, he's more annoying than Wheelie Benz. Uh, I guess what I would actually say is, why don't we make it that Chris is really obsessed with Coke Zero instead of Coke? Like he's mm. like, he's a real proponent of like, because it's exactly, it's the lesser of two evils. Yeah. Yes, it's got those bad chemicals in it, but it is, doesn't necessarily rot your mm. teeth. So maybe it would be like, I would take away the cigarettes, but I would give you the passion. I would replace <laughs> that passion for you. I wouldn't like leave you alone. I'd, I'd love to have a passion for Coke Zero. That, <laughs> yeah, I must you try to acquire it for a sitting yeah. here aggressively rubbing it in my face. I have face. never seen a thin person drink Diet Coke, as there Donald Trump said. And who can gain it? And I think that's a perfect point to end on. <laughs> Chris, Josh, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. You've been listening to Last Orders. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Please do take a moment to leave us a rating and a review. And if you'd like to support the show, why not become a Spiked supporter? Just go to spikes-online.com slash supporters to sign up. That's spikes-online.com slash supporters.